Okay, let's get going. So yes, I'm here to talk about Python packaging um, and where we are today and where we're heading. So, but I think it's useful to start with the more general question of what is software distribution in the first place? Um, and so from my point of view, software distribution covers everything involved in getting software from the people that wrote it to people that can benefit from using it. Uh, and this is something that was changed massively by the creation of the internet. Uh, long gone are the days of getting CDs from the front of uh, computer magazines. Um, and so one of the interesting consequences of this is that we're now to a point where software distribution is an expected feature of programming languages, that, that people expect to have the programming language to come with a way, this is how we distribute software. And developers really, really love this because if you've got a cross-platform programming language, then you don't want to have to learn the ins and outs of packaging software for all the different operating systems that are out there. You want a cross-platform, you want cross-platform distribution tools as well. Um, and it basically means that the same commands that you use to package up your software for distribution on Linux will also make your software available on Windows, it'll make it available on Mac OS X, uh, and ideally you'd like it to let you integrate your stuff for mobile platforms as well. Um, so yeah, and so developers love these cross-platform language-specific tools. Can't say the same for system integrators, we hate them. And the reason we hate them, it's not just blind prejudice, it's the fact that every single language community comes along, reinvents these systems, and they make the same security mistakes every single time. Uh, and so as a system integrator, you're then, instead of just dealing with the security problems in your own distribution system, you're now in the situation where you have to deal with them for C, you have to deal with them for C++, you have to deal with them for Java, for Python, for Ruby, for JavaScript, for Perl, for Haskell, for Erlang, for Go, for Rust. It's an impossible problem. You cannot go to your customers and say, yes, we have happily secured all of these systems. We can give you an audit trail. We can do all of this stuff. It's just not a practical way of doing things. Um, <clears throat> and so for a very, very long time, we have basically had this fight going on between developers who just want to define how they distribute their software once and have it work everywhere. Uh, and system integrators who are like going, hey, look, we actually need to know what we're shipping. We need to know what customers have installed on their systems. Um, like it actually matters that we know what software we're trusting our businesses to, uh, and our governments for that matter. Um, that, that we really, like downloading random software off the internet and running your business on it is still a bad idea. Um, but at the same time, people have kind of voted with their feet. It's like, it, it's the case of telling people don't do that has clearly not worked. Uh, and so what it basically means is we have to figure out a way to do this in a way that works for both groups. That, that you can't just tell the developers, no, don't do that. Um, and you can't just go to the folks who are worried about the security and auditing aspects to say, oh yeah, please just start installing random stuff from the internet, it'll be fine. Um, and so, what does all that mean for Python in particular? Because that's my interest in a lot of this, is that I'm an upstream Python guy who also works for a Linux vendor, uh, and so I have a vested interest in trying to get these two worlds to play nice. Um, and well, in the Python world, historically we were very much on the Linux side of things. That, that Python kind of grew out of a Unix-centric and Linux-centric perspective. Um, and that all our distribution tools were historically pretty much centered around Linux. They kind of assumed that you were coming from a C, C++ background, um, and a lot of it was actually built on making it easy to automate integrating Python into a Linux distro build system. Uh, and then you would actually do the, you would actually do your distribution with RPM or apt or whatever. Um, those assumptions about people are using Linux, um, and people have a C, C++ development background, those are both now completely wrong for the Python audience. Uh, vast, vast numbers of Pythonistas are now coming through where they're learning Python as their first programming language and they're learning it on Windows. Uh, that's 
creates some very, very interesting challenges uh, in terms of changing those assumptions upstream and getting people to recognize that, no, the way we were doing things doesn't work anymore. We need to do something different. And so one of the key things that happened there uh, was, so the standard library module for managing a lot of this stuff is long, as one called Disutils. It was written in the late 90s. Um, and Disutils SIG is the group of people that were focused on that ecosystem and the tools around it. Um, and so for a very long time, Disutils SIG couldn't actually make their own decisions. They couldn't approve new interoperability standards. They couldn't do anything like that. Uh, and, so, and so what happened was, even if they came to agreement on what a new standard needed to look like, they would then have to take it to Python dev and say, hey, we have this new standard, can you please rubber stamp it for us? Um, except that Python dev was pretty much full of, it's full of people that we're kind of looking to the next version of Python. We're looking kind of two, three, four years in advance uh, and saying, okay, what's, what features do we want to make available by default in that kind of time frame? Whereas the packaging ecosystem is all about stuff that has to work with the versions of Python that are popular now. Uh, and so that actually goes all the way back to Python 2.6 at the moment. So Python 2.6 released in 2008, I think. Uh, and so that's a, actually it might even be 2007, but anyway, so Python 2.6, six, seven years old at this point, uh, but still very, very popular because of uh, RHEL and CentOS 6. Uh, and so the packaging tools all need to work back that far. So Python dev is not the right community from that point of view. Like from our perspective, 2.6, we've stopped, it's even out of security maintenance updates at this point. That's entirely on the commercial vendors now. Um, and so Python dev was really the wrong community to be managing a lot of this stuff. Uh, and so we actually changed the way the Python enhancement proposal worked to say to Disutil SIG, look, if it's just a packaging standard, if you're not changing C Python, if you're not changing the standard library, you don't, they don't need to come to Python dev anymore. We can just deal with it all on Disutil SIG. If the tool developers all agree that, that an interoperability standard is the right thing to do, then we can leave Python dev out of it. Uh, and I mean, there's a bunch of us that are in both communities, and that's kind of the bridge. But it was about empowering Disutils to, to say, no, look, this is your problem. You guys deal with it. You're the experts. You're the ones who are worried about all this stuff. You're the ones who have the experience and are working on the tools that will fix it. It's right for you to be making the decisions. Um, and so, yeah, and it really aligned the community with the work that needed to be done. It, it changed the mood on Disutils SIG from everything's broken, we can't do anything about it, to yes, everything's still broken, uh, but we're working on all of it. Um, and it's not all broken anymore, which is nice. Um, if you get involved in Python packaging stuff, the other name you'll come across is the Python Packaging Authority. Um, this originally started as the creators of PIP and VirtualEnv, a couple of tools I'll get into later. Um, this actually became, has now become the home for pretty much all of the Python, the core Python packaging tools. So the Python packaging index, um, setup tools, dislib, uh, dis various other things uh, now all live under the Python packaging authority. Um, and it just basically becomes an umbrella group of, of um, disutil sigs, a bit obscure and very historical name. Um, so, so that's still the mailing list where the PEP decisions get made, but Python Packaging Authority conveys a bit more clearly what the responsibilities of the group are. Um, and so I'm gonna start with, I'm gonna go through some of the things we have successfully done over the last year or two, um, because they're making some fundamental changes to the way the Python packaging ecosystem works. This is one of the biggest ones. So starting with Python 3.4, um, Python actually comes with a package manager. So the pip package manager is bundled with Python 3.4, still, still on its own six month or so update cycle. Um, and so what it means is that Python 3.4 maintenance releases may actually come with new versions of pip. Um, so like when we do the maintenance release, we'll update pip to whatever the latest version is. Uh, and the biggest advantage of this is that previously there was a really tricky bootstrapping problem uh, with external dependencies, which was 
before you could have an external dependency, you would have to explain to people how to bootstrap the package manager. Uh, and that's actually really hard on Windows. Um, and on Linux and Mac OS X, it pretty much amounts to the old curl a shell script and run it, which is always fun. Um, so PEP453 bundled it with 3.4. Um, PEP477, which is going to be implemented for Python 2.7.9, which comes out, is due out in December or so. Uh, what that actually gives us is it will backport this change to Windows and Mac OS X for Python 2.7 as well. Uh, and so those are the ones that had the biggest problems getting hold of PIP, especially Windows. Uh, and so what it means is that folks downloading the python.org binaries will have PIP automatically. Um, and so yeah, and so it basically makes it much, much easier for people to get connected with the Python packaging index ecosystem uh, and get access to the fast array of packages that actually exist for Python. Because um, as it turns out, there's an awful lot of people who seem who, when they think Python, they look at this is what's in the standard library. And they think that's all they have available to them, that they don't necessarily realize that there's actually a whole array of additional add-on packages that's actually just a, just a pip install away. Um, so yeah, so we expect that to have some pretty profound in, impact. Um, there are still security concerns with this. Like, I mean, you are still basically downloading arbitrary software off the internet. Like, PyPI is an uncurated index. Um, we, we check that it meets the packaging standards and you can actually pip install it. Um, actually, we, technically, we don't even check that much. We just check that it meets the, meets the file naming guidelines. Um, and so, yeah, and so the main security thing we're trying to ensure at our level uh, is that what the user downloads is what the dev uploaded. We don't make any assertions about the safety of what the dev themselves uploaded. Um, and so if you want to see what I mean, do pip install Python Nation or not, as your case may be. Uh, uh, but yes, uh, the, uh, it's a nice illustration of the dangers of some of these package level, uh, these language level repositories. Um, one of the other, uh, so this is currently very, this security is currently very um, TLS dependent. Uh, it's basically just focused on securing the link between the end user and um, PyPI servers themselves. Uh, the, some more I'll get into later about that. Uh, one of the other changes of recent times, is where well, recent is the last couple of years, um, the virtual environments tool that lets you have semi-isolated environments for your, uh, for your program dependencies. Um, that was bundled with Python 3.3. Um, turned out they're not particularly useful without the language level package manager. Um, and so in Python 3.4, the integrated virtual environments will install pip into the VN by default. Um, and then the other nice thing about pip being bundled is that pip install virtual env will become something that works on 2.7 and 3.4 out of the box. So bootstrapping the cross, the cross version one becomes a lot easier. Um, the other big change, so as I was saying earlier, for a very, very long time, the assumption was that people would be coming to Python as a second language after first learning something like C or C++. Uh, certainly the way I came to Python, uh, and as the way a lot of the core developers came to Python. Um, however, that's no longer true, and so a lot of people don't know how to compile their own C extensions. Uh, and you can try and automate that, but the fact is that compiling arbitrary C code and arbitrary C++ code can, is genuinely difficult. Like, like the usability of a lot of those tools is actually quite poor. Um, and so for a long time, Python had a binary format called eggs. Those have been around for about 10 years or so. They actually had a bunch of fundamental technical limitations, which is why, which is why they kind of became popular with a certain subset of users whose problems they dealt with specifically, and then everyone outside that community, including all the Linux distros, just went, ooh, no, we're not touching that, um, because it really did have some genuine technical issues. Uh, the wheel format is relatively new. Um, again, the last couple of years, it basically addressed those technical issues and has been, uh, is now supported on the Python package index for Windows and Mac OS X. 
uh, and you can use it in a private index for any platform you want. Uh, and I'll get more into later why we don't allow Linux wheels on PyPI yet. Um, another much more recent one is that we finally have a standardized versioning scheme. So the original setup tools versioning scheme was uh, derived from the Perl one for CPAN. Uh, it was very, very happy to guess. Uh, it, would, it would take any string, any arbitrary string you threw at it, and would try to come up with an ordering. It would never say, I do not understand what the relative order of those is. Um, and so essentially what it meant was that in the, in the standard cases, it gave sensible answers. But in edge cases, it would just do very, very strange things. Uh, and so from a user perspective, it seemed to be picking versions at random. It was actually picking versions in a predictable way. It was just a way that didn't make any sense to people. Um, and so what PEP440 does is it basically goes through and tries to tease out those rules that Setup Tools was using uh, and says, OK, here's where we think Setup Tools was doing the right thing. Here's that formalized as an ordering algorithm. And here's the cases where we expect the tools to just throw up their hands and say, look, no, please make your metadata make sense. Uh, and the standardized version came out with something like 99.7% compatibility with PyPI. And the, the ones that it doesn't accept are things where somebody has basically made a mistake in generating their metadata, and they have something like a wrapper of a version object in there instead of the version number. Uh, we knew we'd gone too far with our compatibility rules when those started showing up as legal again. <laughs> We're like, going, yeah, OK, we need, to, we need to dial the compatibility back a bit there. We don't want those. Um, and so yeah, so PEP440 is ridiculously complicated. Uh, and the reason is it's a superset of all of the different versioning schemes people have used on PyPI over the last 12 years. <laughs> um, but what it is is completely predictable. It's like you can take the algorithm, you can put it in any tool, and you'll get the same answers. Um, we, do not we explicitly do not recommend anyone actually use the full flexibility of PET440 in a single project, because that's a really bad idea. <laughs> the, the, if you use every possible segment, you end up with like six or seven part version numbers. Uh, but yeah, the big, um, it's also mostly a superset of some of the core parts of semantic versioning. Um, so, so yeah, so that's, it, it, it's uh, a very, very complicated spec, but that's just because the history of the versioning system is quite complicated. Um, the, yeah, the recommendation to new folks is, look, just use semant the bits of semantic versioning that are compatible with this, and you'll be fine. Uh, the other nice thing in this is that it adds a explicit local version identifier concept, uh, and so for a very, very long time, uh, if redistributors like the Linux distributions will take a baseline version from upstream and then put additional patches on top of it to fix critical security issues and that kind of stuff. Um, for a very long time, those patches wouldn't show up in the Python level metadata at all uh, because there was no way to report them uh, without breaking the versioning rules. Uh, whereas this scheme has a way to indicate a patch level without affecting any of the version comparisons. So that, that becomes quite nice, that, that you, can, you can still meet, you can still satisfy the versioning constraints while still indicating that you've added extra patches on top. Um, the other big PyPA project worth mentioning uh, is a thing called packaging.python.org. Uh, so historically, the packaging and distribution docs have been included with the CPython docs. Uh, and have hence been version specific. Uh, that they've been, that that's been the case of, you, you would get different distribution docs with Python 3.4 as you would with 2.7. As it turns out, because, because you're distributing software to users who may be using different versions of Python, that's actually a really bad way to structure it. You don't want to do it that way. Um, and so what packaging.python.org is, it's version neutral. It's designed to give instructions that work on all currently supported versions using the cross-version tools. And the distribution and ins installation docs that are shipped with CPython now focus more on giving people a quick introduction to this and then refer out to packaging.python.org for, say, if you want more details, 
go to the online one. Uh, and that, that again is a case of better aligning the communities as well, that, that it puts packaging.python.org in the hands of the folks who care about cross-version packaging, um, while on the CPython side, we just do enough to hook up the bundling and say, look, this is the stuff that's here. Um, these are the reference docs. Um, a slight aside, so all the, PyPA, uh, the Python Packaging Authority work and all the Python Packaging Authority tools, funnily enough, Python specific. Uh, one of the things you can always hit with language specific tool ecosystems is people will go, oh, but I just want this one other thing that's in Ruby or this one other thing that's in Fortran because they're a scientist doing data analysis. Um, and so that's actually a really hard problem to solve. In my view, that's where you actually cross the line from language specific tooling to defining your own platform. Uh, like that problem is one of the key problems that uh, Linux distributions solve, for example. And so what Condor is, Condor is one that came out of the scientific Python community because they do have to deal with this problem. Like none of the very, very few uh, operating system vendors deal well with the Fortran dependency problem. Yet scientists and data analysis use Fortran libraries for a lot of their heavy number crunching. Um, and so Condor is designed as a user level installer that lets you manage not only external dependencies, but also multiple Python runtimes. Um, and so yeah, so that then becomes a tool that is quite uh, primarily aimed at the scientific science and data analysis community, uh, but potentially worth looking at for anyone looking for a cross-platform uh, dependency management system aimed primarily at Python folks. So that's pretty much where we've got to today. Um, that brings us to at least parity with other language-specific tooling ecosystems. Ahead in some areas, slightly behind in others uh, when it comes to certain aspects of usability. Um, but I think we're getting to a pretty good place, particularly once 2.7.9 comes out next month. Uh, and, and so everywhere has pip by default. Um, where we want to go next, though, is, well, there's a few different things that we still want to improve, that we don't, we're not happy with where they're at yet. Um, one of the big ones is this this notion of metadata 2.0. So the current metadata is basically the old core metadata plus some various setup tools extensions that we basically just agreed, okay, they solve the core problem, let's just keep using them until where we really do hit their limits. So let's keep going with, with what we have. So what metadata 2.0 is designed to do is those existing formats were pretty much all set, all laid out before JSON was invented. So JSON was invented in 2006 or so. Uh, a lot of the Python packaging metadata was defined in the early 2000s, uh, some of it in the late 90s. So metadata 2.0 switches us over to JSON because that's just easy, nice and easy to work with, works well with web-oriented APIs, uh, works well as an on-disk format. It's just a nice format to work with. Um, the other thing is that metadata 2.0 is specifically designed to be a generated metadata format. It's designed for tools to be able to talk to each other. It's not really designed for humans to use it as a direct data entry format. Um, and so setup tools, for example, even under metadata 2.0, setup.py or setup.config will still be the way you feed the metadata into the tool chain. Uh, and then it will take care of generating all the JSON on the back end. Like it's not, we don't think JSON's a great format for actual human entry of metadata. Um, and so you can easily see people say, oh, well, let's have a YAML input format that they then translate to JSON, all that sort of stuff. Um, the main idea with this is that the tools that the developer uses to build their stuff shouldn't dictate the tools that the uh, end user has to use to install it. So they should be able to use any installer that understands this format. Um, and the other thing is that it's deliberately designed so you can ship it in parallel with the metadata 1.x. So, so that you can ship all the current metadata and the new metadata and the tools will use whichever ones they can, they can do. Um, one of the big things about metadata 2.0 is it's deliberately designed that it, that includes redistribution as part of the data model. Uh, that, that 
a lot of upstream packaging ecosystems are designed with the assumption that everybody's going to be getting their stuff directly from upstream in the format that the developer published it in. Um, in reality, an awful lot of people, like redistributors make money for a reason. Um, like customers like what we do. Um, and so Metadata 2.0 is designed to basically achieve that thing I was talking about earlier of getting upstream and redistributors to work together rather than fighting with each other. Uh, and, and saying, look, we, we did serve different purposes for different groups of people. Um, let's try and find a way to work together rather than against each other. Um, the other thing it does is it breaks up the dependencies a lot more. Uh, so current metadata, you can have uh, install requires and setup requires. Um, and Metadata 2 breaks those up a bit more so that you can more easily separate your build requirements from your test requirements from the requirements you actually need to work on it locally. Um, and then, of course, your actual runtime requirements. Um, the meta one is interesting. Uh, one of the really common problems we see is people being too restrictive with their versioning dependencies. Um, and so they'll publish stuff on PyPI with exact version locks. Uh, that's actually a real, really bad idea because it means that you can't get security updates for your dependencies without changing your metadata requirements. Uh, and that's actually a real problem, especially from a redistributor point of view. Uh, and so metadata 2 strongly encourages the idea that if you're a library, um, then you should be using run requirements, and which won't allow you to version lock. Um, and then if you do want a version lock, then you're talking meta requirements. And that's the case where what you're doing is you're distributing a complete application or you're distributing a bundle. Um, so like PyObjC, um, so the Objective-C wrappers for Python, for example. You can actually download all the individual components of that as individual pip installable pieces. Or there's a pip install PyObjC, I think, which will actually just grab all the current versions of all of them. Uh, and so the idea there is you define that as a meta requirement and get an exact version match. Um, <clears throat> the other big thing Metadata 2 adds is our current metadata format's not extensible. Like the only way to add new stuff to it is to actually update the spec. Um, that's a big problem because it means people can't really experiment with different ideas and say, hey, let's try this for a while, see if it's a good idea. If it works, then propose it for standardization. Um, that's the way we'd like to be able to do things. Current metadata format, we can't. Metadata 2, we can. Um, and so a lot of, uh, one of the things we've been working through with Metadata 2 for a while now is actually identifying things that were originally in the Metadata 2 spec and figuring out what we can actually pull out to a standard extension and say, this isn't in the core, this is an extension in its own right. Uh, and so lots of things like um, documentation references, contact details for the project, um, constraints on the environment that you install into, they're all defined as extensions. So you don't use so, so tools can mostly ignore those if they don't need them. Um, one of the interesting things we were able to do with this is, so one of the big things in the metadata is the contact details for the project and the contributors at that level. Um, so because that's now an extension, you can easily say, hey, well, there's a second extension with the same format, which has all the integrated contact info. So, so if it's redistributed, then you can have, then you can have that info in there as well. Um, the one thing that is in the metadata 2.0 spec is the idea of mandatory extensions. Uh, and what that is, is if your project really needs an extension to be interpreted in order to install correctly, uh, you can flag it as mandatory. Uh, and then any installer that doesn't understand it will just say, this needs an extension I don't understand, I can't install this. And the idea is that that will let us eventually do post-commit, uh, post-install hooks. That, that you'll be able to say, I need a post-install hook, which means I can only in in be installed by something that knows how to run them. Uh, so yeah, so that'll let us get there eventually. Uh, another one we like is binary packages for Linux. Um, this is probably going to require a new revision of the wheel spec. Uh, and the reason is that currently on Linux, 
every Linux distro shows up with the exact same set of compatibility tags. Uh, oddly enough, this doesn't work very well. Um, and, it just, and, it, and it just falls out of the way uh, the current version of the wheel spec is defined. Um, and so we have some ideas for ways to experiment with that and try different things. Uh, but my suspicion is that we're going to, we may end up needing to do a wheel 2.0 spec to solve this properly. Um, and that's OK. It's like the, the, the current version works well for private indexes, Windows and Mac OS X. It's not a bad achievement. Um, in Fedora, we're at least looking at the idea of doing a Fedora um, FBI server. Uh, but yeah, it's the case of those compatibility tags are a problem at the moment, that they're not fine-grained enough to deal with Linux properly. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's an area we're currently looking at, and we'll, we may eventually do something on uh, based on slash etc. OS release to automate all of that. Um, and then the last one I'd like to talk about is end-to-end uh, -end package signing. Uh, because this is one that keeps coming up where, it's so like at the moment, because the way we do things is very heavily focused on SSL and TLS, or TLS now, since SSL v3 got turned off, um, is that what it means is we can't currently run a public mirror network uh, because we don't have signing that can cope with public mirrors. Um, and so instead we use a CDN donated by uh, Fastly.net. Um, and so that gets us good performance, but we would like to, to be able to have that public, the option of a public mirror network again. There's a bunch of, um, a bunch of security researchers uh, have come up with a thing called the update framework. Uh, and it's basically, it's basically a design that came out of a whole bunch of research into different kinds of vulnerabilities in different software distribution systems, including the Linux distributions. Um, so PEP458 is their main proposal, uh, and we're currently working to split that up into two different proposals, one which just secures the PyPI to end user link um, and, and still leaves, still doesn't solve the PyPI, um, uh, the malicious PyPI admins problem or comp PyPI compromise. That will at least give the ability to run a public mirror network. Um, and then the second PEP, which we're currently in the process of getting published, uh, will cover the harder problem of how do we deal with an untrusted PyPI? How, how do you get developer to end user uh, signing? Um, which there's issues running that on an uncurated index just because most developers aren't going to want to deal with the key management problem, but it's still a useful way to go. It's, it's, a, it's a good feature to have available. Um, so yeah, so those things that we're currently working on uh, no ETAs for any of them because it's all uh, as as time becomes available and as as as, uh, as we get through various things. Uh, but yeah, so that's where where we're at now. I think is a pretty good place once we get two seven nine out with pip bundled with it, uh, and then it's just that basically gets the front end in place where where people say yep, yeah, just use pip. Uh, and then we can keep iterating on the back-end tools and back-end infrastructure to just kind of silently upgrade the security and features in the background. As, so. Do we have time for questions? Just one minute. Okay. Questions. One or two questions. So, yep. Hi, Nick. Um, how does what you're saying uh, on a Linux distro change the relationship with the distro's packaging system like YUM? Yep. Are they going to be um, matched one for one for package for RPM to IPI? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. Uh, my perspective from a software as a server developer point of view uh, is I see distro packaging is giving me the base OS layer and my language runtime. Uh, and then inside the language runtime, the application developers take over and use language specific tools. Um, I think that's a model that works well for web services. It makes admins happy. It makes uh, devs happy, uh, and you and you kind of treat you kind of treat any use of system of language level packaging as a technical debt issue. That you're like going, okay, we really do want this to be in distro format, um, but that becomes something that you get it shipped first using language specific formats, and then as a technical debt reduction activity, you get it packaged properly for the OS. Um, 
and I think that gives you a better dynamic in terms of delivering functionality uh, and, and um, delivering that long-term maintainability that comes with inclusion in the distro. Um, so yeah, so, so I think that, and I think that's, I think that's kind of becoming more of an accepted model on the distro side as well, at least in Fedora. Um, like we've got the environments and stacks working group now, which is figuring out how to do this stuff in a way that works better for devs and for, um, and for, uh, that works for both devs and sysadmins is kind of what environments and stacks is about. Um, so, but yeah, it's, yeah, it's an open question really. That, that, that. So. Anyone else? Cool, thank you.